Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Impact 2012. Um, I'm Anna Nugent. I'm one of the coordinating producers of the festival, along with Alex Mallory. And um, Impact is a six and a half week political arts festival that's dedicated to critical issues leading up to this year's national election. Uh, we have 44 uh, day festival with films, theater, comedy, conversation, music, poetry. Um, and we're here through the end of August, through the 26th. So we have loads of different events. Um, tomorrow we're screening Addiction Incorporated. So we'd love to see you all here. Um, this week we're focusing on democracy matters. Citizens United, voter suppression, and constitutional rights. And I am thrilled to welcome to the stage <laughs> Isaiah Castilla, uh, Mimi Marziani, Marziani um, and Diana Sen. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about Isaiah, and then he'll introduce the rest of the panel. Um, uh, Isaiah serves as Advocacy Programs Counsel at the Alliance for Justice. Prior to joining AFJ, Isaiah was a founding member of the Castilla Law Group and worked in finance direction for a number of political campaigns. So <laughs> he knows a lot about all these subjects. So um, please give a warm welcome to the panel for tonight. All right, well, we're glad to be here today. And I just want to uh, first um, introduce our, our wonderful uh, panelists this, um, this evening. Um, we have Mi Mimi Marziani. Uh, Mimi serves as counsel for the program at NYU School of Law's Brennan Center for Justice, where she focuses on money and politics, voting rights, and legislative dysfunction. Mimi frequently writes on democracy issues and has contributed opinion editorials to US News and World Report, the National Law Journal, Politico, and the New York Law Journal. In September 2010, she was invited to testify on the constitutionality of, of filibuster reform before the Senate R Committee on Rules and Administration. Uh, let's give Mimi a hand. <laughs> and to my right, we have Diana Sin. Uh, Diana is Senior Counsel for Latino Justice, uh, Pearl Def, uh, where she heads their practice working to safeguard the civil rights of Latinos in, South, in the southeastern United States. Uh, Diana is immediate past president of the Hispanic National Bar Association and is uh, the chair of the Civil Rights Committee of the New York State Bar. She has received many awards, including an Outstanding Women Award from El Diario and an Outstanding In-House Counsel Award, lots of awards, uh, <laughs> from the National Bar Association Nonprofit Committee. And let's give Diana a hand. So um, as I said before, I'm glad to be here. I'm Isaiah Castillo. I'm with Alliance for Justice. And we're privileged and, and thankful to have uh, the Culture Project as one of our member organizations. Uh, and so we, we think this subject that we're talking about today is extremely important. And I think um, both of you would agree it's uh, 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 extremely important um, issues that we're facing uh, today in our democracy. The question of participation and, and, and power of, of the people. So I wanted to start off um, by uh, just talking to you for uh, uh, Diana, just beginning with you. If you could kind of talk about, I know uh, a few states, I think about 10 states have recently passed what some people are, are describing as very, um, very intense and uh, uh, restrictive voter ID, photo ID laws. And, you know, oftentimes when I talk to people about this issue, the question is always, what's the big deal, right? Everybody has a photo ID. Can you just talk to us about I, the voter ID, why this is an important issue, and, and why it's so restrictive to, to so many people. Absolutely, well I think, I think the real key is the assumption that everyone has IDs is not a correct assumption at all. And there are many people who don't have IDs, have expired IDs, have lost their IDs. They may not necessarily be able to afford to get IDs or take off from their regular jobs during the limited hours that the DMV is open. 
Um, so I think that the assumption that everyone has IDEs is something that's difficult. I think what's also really important about a lot of these voter ID laws is that you may actually um, have an ID, but you may not have it with you at the time when you actually go to a poll. Um, so there's just general barriers, and for us, we believe it to, to be sort of a barrier to voting and to be disenfranchising. And we think that that's really the key. It's not whether you have the ID or not. It's whether you have the right to vote and are able to exercise that right. And, and what groups do you think, um, or what people, demographics-wise, would be most uh, impacted by by the these these laws? Well, we definitely find that minority voters are most impacted, and basically dependent on the state. We've done some analysis where we find that minority voters are disproportionately impacted. And we find that if you look at the numbers, it's it's pretty stark. And I know mm -hmm. um, one example is obviously South Carolina that I know Mimi is um, battling with in, um, in federal court as we speak. And in, I know recently today in Pennsylvania, there was a, a ruling that came down on the Pennsylvania voter ID law. Um, and so there's a belief out there, some believe that it's one one party is trying to restrict uh, certain voters from being able to have an opportunity to vote. And um, Can you talk about the any cases or that case in, in Pennsylvania? What, what exactly happened there? And what's what's what are the what are the what does the law say? Um, and, and what does it mean for uh, the citizens there in that state? Well, my understanding is that the, the federal judge felt that or believed that the voter ID law at issue in Pennsylvania did not pose um, a high burden on the individual voter. But um, so he found that that it was acceptable. I, I can actually, I'm fairly familiar with the Pennsylvania lawsuit. Um, I mean, what's striking about Pennsylvania, it's a state court case actually, and it was brought under the state constitutional right to vote. And this was a pretty heavy lift for the plaintiffs because just the way that the law is written, it sets a very high bar for that right. sort of challenge. Right. Um, you know, despite that high bar, the plaintiffs in that case brought some pretty amazing facts to life. First, the state of Pennsylvania admitted that there are no cases of in-person fraud, meaning that there is no problem that the ID law would address. Right. And that's the whole, uh, apparently yes. like the whole premise of these voter ID laws is there's that's so exactly much right. voter, voter fraud. Right? And then the second thing is yeah. the um, plaintiffs also successfully showed that, I mean, there's still some dispute, but and the court affirms today that between, somewhere between one and 9% of Pennsylvania's registered voter population lacks one of the acceptable IDs. So we're talking about hundreds and thousands of people. Ultimately, um, unfortunately, the court found that the plaintiffs couldn't get over that high bar because, the, the, I mean, in my view, the, the court just misinterpreted the facts. I mean, he said that it wasn't kind of a pervasive enough burden mm -hmm. among the population. That, of course, is missing the point, right? Because right. we know that most people have IDs. That's a fact, right? 90% of the population, rough estimate, right. has a driver's license um, or, or the other types of IDs that are required. The problem is, is it's a huge burden for the minority that do not currently have IDs. And these folks tend to be disproportionately racial minorities, young, disabled, elderly. And that, of course, is where you know the burden on voting is most problematic. So it was a really unfortunate, unfortunate ruling out of Pennsylvania today. Yeah, and I found it was really interesting um, when the House Majority Leader there in Pennsylvania right. <laughs> had some comments about the voter ID law. In fact, he said it would help Mitt Romney win. And do you think that politics plays a role in in these in in these laws at all? Is it about voter fraud? I mean, what do the numbers show? Um, I know Pennsylvania may yeah. be one case, but... Well, I would just say, I mean, we don't look at things on a political basis. We're obviously nonpartisan, nonprofit organizations who are focused on the opportunity for, stu for citizens to be able to vote equally. Um, we obviously can't opine on, you know, the bases for these type of voter ID laws, because obviously we're not initiating that. 
Um, however, I'm sure there have been, you know, very vocal um, media outlets that have sort of reported on the impact um, that those not only would have, not only the, did, that these voter ID laws have on minority voters, but also there might be some type of partisan correlation, but that's not something that we particularly deal with. I mean, we too are nonpartisan, completely nonpartisan organization. And I too agree that, you know, I obviously would not speak to the mindset of every single lawmaker that's passed these types of laws uh, into existence. I will say, though, that in state after state after state, I mean, we know that there is not a problem with in person voter fraud. And for the most part, when we look at state legislative records, the lawmakers don't seem to think there's a problem either. And that raises a big question. If there's, if, you're, if you're not actually seeking the problem that you say you're trying, seeking to solve the problem you say you're trying to solve, well, what are you doing? And, and right. I mean, that leaves you, I mean, you can draw your own conclusions, but it's also a fact that after the 2010 election and we saw um, state legislatures change party hands uh, all across the country, that after that occurrence, there was a wave of these photo ID laws. And, and they don't just require identification to vote, which nobody has a problem with, right? I mean, yeah. obviously, we need to keep our elections secure. The problem is, is they require a very select set of IDs to vote. And these select set of IDs have a, nothing to do with actually proving your identity, which you could do in a variety of ways, and B, do nothing to solve a non-existent problem, but actually just burden voting. And um, so all that is to say is, you know, I, I would never speak to the mindset of every single person, but it was a national movement to enact these laws, and uh, it does certainly have a whiff of trying to change the rules in the middle of the game. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, that's... You know, I guess what I don't want to want us to venture off into partisanship, but um, because that's that's one of the things we try not to do is uh, or keep an eye on. And, and um, we do have Republican leaders like the yeah. House Majority Leader in Pennsylvania saying straight up, right. "We did this because we want Romney to win." Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> which is, which is <laughs> um, so, and, and so there, there there's voter ID and there is also some other issues, and we were talking about this backstage, um, we we're talking about the Florida voter purge and, and how, it, how it could potentially uh, affect Latino voters in, in that state. Can you talk a little bit about that voter purge, that movement um, down there? Absolutely, and we definitely don't believe it's potentially um, going to disproportionately impact Latino voters. Um, basically, the Florida Secretary of State, Ken Densner, came up with a particular plan of taking a list that could have 182,000 registered voters on that list. And he took that list and determined that that list may have alleged non-citizens. And that list was compiled from looking at, you know, Department of Motor Vehicle data. And from that 182,000 potential list in the state of Florida, which we all know is obviously a very key state um, in the national election in November. But he started with sort of doing a test of having a 2,600 person list. And with that list, we immediately were obviously very engaged. Of that list, that 2,600 person list, which is obviously just a small portion, 58% of those were Latino voters. And if you collectively look at that list, almost 80% were minority voters. So could you imagine, it's almost like you're targeting Latino and minority voters to disenfranchise them, people who have already been registered to vote. Hmm. Do you guys all know what purging, that's kind of a term yeah. of art. I mean, yeah. explain, talk about purging. Yeah, I, you, the, the, um, all states have voter registration rules and actually they, you know, they have to go through some sort of process to keep these rolls up to date because people move, people die, um, some people just never show up to vote again. So there have to be mechanisms to um, keep the rolls clean and accurate. And, and you know, I think that all of our organizations support that. However, the problem becomes when these purges happen, especially when it's so close to an election which could leave people without recourse and without the ability to detect it in time. Um, and when you have a purge that is based on, you know, obviously, 
criteria that has nothing to do with keeping the rules accurate. I mean, that's when we really are concerned. And that's what's typically referred to, I think, commonly as a purge um, versus li list maintenance. Basically, there's systematic maintenance that is something that's allowed and obviously favored and, and something that election officials often do. Um, but this was a particular list that targeted individuals. And what they did is the data wasn't accurate or even reliable. And many people on the list not only were citizens, but we even had like a war veteran hero who was, who, you know, was born in Brooklyn um, and obviously fought for our country and was on the list. And they took a database like the Department of Motor Vehicles that doesn't even deal with citizenship issues at all and ended up taking that database, which we all know is very outdated, and took that to sort of target a list of 2,600. And from that, I mean, there are many litigations, many lawsuits that filed, particularly the Department of Justice filed a lawsuit against the state of Florida in the Northern District of Florida, in the northern part of the state, stating that this purge using 2,600 was not only not a reliable list, and believed to be discriminatory because it had a disproportionate impact on, the, on minority voters, but also because it was very close to an election. Mm -hmm. And basically, there's the National Voter Registration Act that states that you cannot purge someone from the voter list 90 days before an election. Because basically, people should have the opportunity to vote and to know that they're going to vote and they can't be taken off the list in such a short time period for the election. And a lot of that, too, is just to you know, ensure the veracity of the election. So after the Department of Justice filed suit, we ended up filing suit as well in the Southern District of Florida because a lot of the voters, the majority of the voters from that 2,600-person list were from South Florida. Mm -hmm. And we believed it had a disproportionate impact on minority voters. And we filed not only saying that Florida could not purge so close to the election primary, which was actually yesterday, but also that it had a disproportionate impact on minority voters. And then there was another lawsuit that was also filed um, in the middle district of Florida under an, a, a very important section called Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And basically, if the state of Florida's five counties or other parts of the United States uh, before they can change any type of voter registration requirement or election requirement or anything dealing with elections, they have to get pre-clearance from either the Department of Justice or they have to go through the D.C. District Court. And that lawsuit emanated from the fact that the state of Florida was changing this very important election um, issue and did not provide notice or get pre-clearance. So there were three competing lawsuits that practically were filed um, simultaneously. And our lawsuit you know, continues and we continue to fight this issue. So the good part is that after the Secretary of State realized the unreliability of this list that they were attempting to use, they ended up temporarily stopping the purge. Um, but we found out today that the Secretary of State is now announcing that he will reinitiate the purge um, and one lawsuit that I forgot to mention, in addition to the three that I mentioned, is that the state of Florida actually sued the Department of Homeland Security asking for access to its SAVE database so that it could get citizenship information so that it could continue to purge its voters. Um, and ultimately, the Department of Homeland Security is working with the state of Florida to be able to give them access to that database. And by the way, in case you were wondering, there's also no problem with non-citizens voting, right? Like, people don't do that because it would be a ludicrous thing to do, obviously. The, the, the gain you could get from it would be very small, one vote, but the potential downside is deportation, fines, jail. I mean, you'd have to be completely, completely unhinged to do that sort of act. And so there's a reason that we don't actually see you know, some sort of rampant wave of people without proper papers trying to vote. It just, it's, a, it's another non-existent problem. And it's also a felony in Florida, so. 
<laughs> so, so there are all kinds of shenanigans going on in Florida. <laughs> on, on, That's on a the good border. word. Yeah, it could, and there's also the, the uh, voter registration uh, yeah. law. I was in say Florida. we we had two lawsuits That's in Florida. Really <laughs> was uh, talk, can you talk about that just briefly, maybe, uh, on the the voter registration mm -hmm. restrictions they put on some organization? Well, sure. organizations trying to. Um, so last year, Florida passed an omnibus bill that, in many ways. Um, encapsulated uh, many of the negative voting law changes that we've seen in the last two years. The Florida bill made it harder to stay registered to vote when you move from one county to another. It eliminated uh, the early voting period, um, particularly the Sunday right before election, where um, I think if I have my math right, I think 50% of the African American population in Florida chose to cast their ballot uh, in 2008. Um, it, placed extremely onerous restrictions on groups like the League of Women Voters and Rock the Vote that go out and do uh, community-based voter registration activity, essentially putting those groups out of business. And have to get the know, applications there some, in. There was in, something in else bad, days. but yeah. um, that, so two lawsuits came out of that. Uh, one, as we were saying before, there are five counties in Florida that are covered by the Voting Rights Act. And so before they can enact any sort of voting change, they have to seek permission from the federal government. Um, that permission was denied and they sued. Simultaneously, the Brennan Center, uh, working with a law firm here in New York and representing um, <coughs> Rock the Vote, the League of Women Voters, and US PERG, we filed a lawsuit in the Northern District of Florida um, saying that these new restrictions on voter registration drives were unconstitutional, that they violated the First Amendment rights of speech and association right. of these folks on the ground at farmers markets, at colleges, telling people that voting is good and trying to um, encourage people to vote. And I'm very happy to say that we were successful in that lawsuit. Um, the judge pointed out that all of these restrictions were completely unnecessary and the I mean, they were ludicrous. One was from the moment you collected a voter registration form, you had to get it into the state within 48 hours or you would get fined. Yeah. Um, there were also, it was also a rule that before you could ask to collect, I mean, like, I don't know, you don't even need to be a lawyer for like the free speech <laughs> bells to go off here. Before you were allowed to ask somebody if um, they wanted you, it, before you were allowed to say, can I help you um, you know, fill out and submit your completed voter registration form, you had to get approval from the state. So there was a, just a straight up prior restraint requirement. Um, and then there was all sorts of administrative burdens, Tra volunteers, I mean, Rock the Vote's a great example. They have college kid volunteers. They have a whole internal training program. They've never had a problem, but the new, um, the new law would have made them track every single one of their volunteers, including their address, and you know when they terminate their em their employment. Which I mean, all these things are just ludicrous when you're if you've ever worked with a grassroots nonprofit. So luckily, we got the law enjoined, and um, as of uh, Friday, actually, we reached a settlement agreement with the state by which um, the, the, the biggest part is they basically agreed to consent to that injunction. So that means those laws are no longer in place and groups are back on the ground doing voter registration work. That's great. Um, and so I, I just want to shift gears and stay here uh, with you for a minute, Mimi, sure. and talk about um, who, let me ask this first, who knows about Citizens United? Who's heard about, okay. So that's, that's pretty much the whole group, everybody, yeah. pretty much the whole crowd. Um, so can you talk a little bit about um, and again, we wanted to try to bring this all together and talk about democracy and participation in our democracy. Um, talk about Citizens United. Um, Citizens United is, a, it's often used as a shorthand to refer to lots of different problems in the campaign finance right. system, but specifically the lawsuit um, uh, it was a case decided by the US Supreme Court in January 2010. And the Supreme Court's uh, main holding was that corporations uh, have the same rights to spend money on political advertisements as human beings. And uh, in doing so, it struck down a longstanding law that required corporations 
to form a separate political committee um, to spend in elections. And those separate political committees could not be funded by straight up profits or by general treasury funds. They had to be funded by uh, contributions from employees and things like that. So even though we previously did have corporations spending money in elections, uh, the actual money came from human beings, and it was just you know kind of through a, a committee that was associated with the business. Um, and Citizens United changed all that. It said that corporations, both for profit and non profit, could just reach into their general coffers and start spending money on uh, campaign advertisements. Obviously, um, the, the, the potential magnitude of, of this decision is astronomical. I mean, a, a group like ExxonMobil, which I think had a million dollars in its pack in 2008, but had a, you know, had a 90 million worth of 90 billion, I have no idea, some, sort of, lot, yeah. some sort of crazy it's a lot number. Of money. <laughs> some sort of crazy <laughs> number in profits that, you know, theoretically at least, they could spend all of that um, on political advertisements. I mean, it's a pretty scary thought. From that ruling, um, the, the, the part of that ruling that's talked about the most is this notion that uh, corporations have the same First Amendment rights to spend money on political advertisements. The second part of the ruling, though, that's not as typically discussed was the notion that if I spend money independently of a candidate camp campaign for, but, but to benefit that candidate, somehow that money cannot be corrupting. And so let me put, give an example. Right. So Sheldon Adelson, uh, as many people know, gave um, you know, millions and millions of dollars to Newt Gingrich's presidential campaign uh, while Newt Gingrich was still running. So the, under the Supreme Court's logic, because, and the super PAC, of course, is very closely affiliated to Newt Gingrich's campaign, but they are not technically connected. connected. They're different entities. Um, I mean, it's, it's run by his friends and close colleagues, and obviously he knows everything that's going on. But but they're at, not connected. But, but, <laughs> a, but I mean, as a legal matter, they're clearly not connected. Right. So under the Supreme Court's logic, because they are legally independent, Newt Gingrich's money in no way could corrupt I mean, Sheldon Adelson's money in no way could corrupt Newt Gingrich if he were to be elected president. I mean, this obvious, I mean, this defies common sense. It's hard, I mean, people always have me explain this twice because it seems like such a crazy thing to say. But um, that reasoning is actually the, uh, the logical route to super PACs. Because once you take the premise that independent spending cannot corrupt, the next step is to say, then therefore you can place basically no limits on groups that only collect and spend independently of candidates. And that's what happened. And, and it created these mutant political committees, super PACs, that can collect donations in any amount and then spend that money in any amount to aid candidate campaigns. Um, and that's where we are right now. I mean, and, and so now we're heading into the most expensive election season ever. Um, and most of that money, well, we'll see. Maybe not most, but a huge, huge, huge amount of money, millions and millions of dollars, is going to come not from candidates, um, you know, and at least like a candidate has to show up at the end of the day on the ballot, and we can tell the candidate what we think about them by voting. But most of this money is coming in by independent groups that, A, for the most part, are not disclosing all of their donors, and B, we have very few ways to hold them truly accountable. So it's a really, um, I mean, it's it's a crazy situation. Yeah. No one's quite sure what's going to happen. Yeah.